Last night, I spoke with Chris Merritt about a new academic paper written by Nicholas Aroni, a constitutional law professor at the University of Queensland. It's found that the PM's voice proposal will likely give the Commonwealth the incredible power to legislate, regardless of whether the Commonwealth has the power to do so, based merely on a representation that the voice makes. In other words, the voice has the potential to upend over 100 years of constitutional practice and blur the dividing line between state and federal responsibilities. Join me to discuss this further is the author of the paper himself, Professor Nicholas Aroni, and Barrister Louise Clegg, who's been instrumental in exposing some of the legal unknowns with the voice. Professor Aroni, Louise Clegg, thank you for your time. Professor, I'd start with you if I can, please. We know that if the voice gets up, it will create a new chapter in the Constitution. But in your paper, you argue it could create a whole new head of power. Now, that's far more significant than just a new chapter. Why do you say that? Uh, Peter, look, it's, it's a function of uh, what is being proposed in the Constitutional Amendment and, in fact, a, a fairly recent change because it was always the idea that the parliament would be given the power to legislate to regulate the voice, in particular its composition, powers, procedures and functions. However, a late change was made to the drafting of the proposal so that now it says that the parliament is to have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the voice. And the point is that these mm -hmm. are words of wide connective um, import, as the uh, Solicitor General himself said in his advice to the Attorney General. And so one has to ask, well, what's a matter relating to the Indigenous voice? And the primary function of the voice is to make representations to the Parliament. And you would expect those representations to concern laws, the proposal to enact laws or amend or repeal laws. And so it's not a long step for the court, if ever um, push came to shove, um, to find that uh, this power to legislate with respect to matters relating to the voice would include a power to legislate in relation to the content of representations by the voice and even to implement any recommendations that might be contained in those representations. Um, it's a little bit like the, in fact, so, the external affairs power. Uh, so let me just jump in there with an know, example. Under, in the famous... Yeah, sure. So let me just jump in for an example for people at home. So, so right now in the Constitution, uh, the Crimes Act, the bulk of the stuff we deal with with police is at a state jurisdictional level. Let's say the voice has uh, um, something to say about um, the juvenile detention or, or the rates of Aboriginal people in jails. And it makes a recommendation or gives its representation, advice the PM might want to call it to the government. And the government decides to move on it or, or the court, the High Court, um, imposes that on the government, then you could find the Commonwealth legislating about policing or about jails in a sense that that's previously been um, a state area of responsibility. Is that what you're talking about? It had, I think it does have that potential because the, the voice's function is to make representations on matters relating to Indigenous peoples. And plainly, laws of that nature relate to Indigenous peoples. And so this broad use of connecting language that's being proposed, a power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the voice, um, could therefore open up this power to legislate to implement the recommendations of the voice. Look, it could be read more narrowly. Um, people could say, well, look, the intention is that the power is to legislate in relation to the, the composition of the voice and its procedures. In other words, the institution of mm. the voice itself. But the problem is that the High Court has insisted that it doesn't pay attention to subjective expectations, but it looks at the language that is used. Uh, and it doesn't read down the language in, uh, granting power to the Parliament to legislate by reference to trying to maintain a federal balance between the Commonwealth and the states. It interprets the language as widely as the words used can reasonably sustain. Louise Clegg, how concerned are you? I know you've uh, you've spoken about a lot of the legal unknowns with the voice, but, but we're having this debate now. It's gaining traction now. And as of yesterday, Australians are already out there casting their vote. Um, it's extraordinary, Peter. Um, pretty much unheard of. Uh, in previous uh, referenda, we've had uh, constitutional conventions and platforms provided to um, 
lawyers and not just lawyers, but anyone who wished to contribute and dissent. Um, but that just never happened in this case. Um, in at the Gama Festival last year, the Prime Minister um, put forward the words that are pretty much what we have now. And as Nick just explained, um, if anything, they've, the, the proposal has become bigger and more powerful. Um, he said then that there would be opportunity for people to get involved in having a say on it, but that opportunity was never given uh, by the government. Uh, there was a um, an inquiry, an parliamentary um, joint select committee in April, but by that point, the bill had already been crafted and was sort of sailing through parliament. Um, and even then, a lot of people on the no side and not of lawyers on the low side considered that to be a bit of a sham, to be honest, because it only lasted for about two weeks of hearings, whereas in previous referenda, those sorts of processes have often lasted months. Um, but even worse, the um, hand-picked lawyers um, of the Constitutional Expert Committee uh, were sort of paraded through early um, and gave oral evidence to the committee. Um, and this was while the very eminent and um, quite a few eminent retired judges and um, Nick and his colleague, Peter um, Durangelos, were making um, their written submissions and they never even had an opportunity to address the committee about their very serious and much broader concerns than the committee was dealing with. So this, the fact that this has come up now is a very major issue, an, an issue that should have constitutional law uh, um, academics and practitioners all around the country pouring all over it is extraordinary mm. uh, when, as you say, people are off to the polling booths. Professor, what about the risk that the voice could actually take the government to the High Court if it feels it hasn't been uh, consulted enough on an issue that it feels relates to or affects Aboriginal people? Take us through this risk and, and what it would mean to our system of government if, if that's in fact the reality. So, Peter, the constitutional amendment has to be read in the context of the Australian legal system as a whole. And Lawyers refer to a body of law called administrative law. And under that principle, uh, whenever a government or executive decision maker exercises a statutory power, makes a decision, exercises a power, they are required to take every mandatory consideration into consideration and not take irrelevant considerations into account when making that decision. Now, if a person aggrieved by that decision uh, believes that the decision maker failed to take a mandatory consideration into account, they can seek to initiate proceedings in a court asking the court to quash the decision, to nullify the decision, and to require the decision maker to go back and make the decision again, properly taking into consideration what it should have taken into consideration. And so the interesting question is, by amending the Constitution to give the Indigenous voice the power or the right to make representations to the executive government, noting that the constitution mm. is superior to the statutory law and the common law, it's quite arguable that this would be interpreted by the courts to mean that representations made by the voice on matters relating to Indigenous peoples would be mandatory considerations that must be considered whenever a decision maker exercises a power. Um, and that would trigger these administrative law remedies, which it has to be emphasised, are exercised all the time. Uh, but that's how, um, or that's one of the practical effects, as it were, of the proposed constitutional amendment that I think is worth bearing in mind. I know it's late in the day, Nicholas Aroni, but uh, you do your country a great service by putting pen to paper and putting out this research paper, at least this side of the vote now in 10 days' time. Louise Clegg, thank you. Your advocacy has been... Uh, Pretty extraordinary on The Voice as well. Both of you, I appreciate your time tonight. Professor Nicola Cerrone there and Louise Clegg.